Hey guys, welcome back to Reserve Investments on YouTube. This is part two of my 1500 subscriber Q&A. And spoiler alert, due to the magnitude of questions I got asked, there's probably gonna be a part three and possibly a part four to this series, depending on how much ground we can cover. So I'm gonna start right out with the questions. And of course, a lot of you are asking video game collecting questions. So here we go. What is the best place to sell a graded video game? That's a very interesting question because you're not telling me if the video game is graded by VGA or WADA Games because there is a difference in my answer. There would also be a difference in my answer if you told me if the game is vintage or modern. So I'm going to cover that and how I respond to your question. So as I stated, there's two prominent video game grading companies at present time. There's VGA, which is affiliated with AFA, Action Figure Authority, that grades vintage Star Wars figures and toys, items of that nature. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have a lot of games. Now, here's something that you may not know. A lot of the vested interests or people that have a vested interest in WADA games also have a vested interest in certain auction sites, whether it be heritage auctions or certified link, which is owned by Comic Link. Now, as a result of that, if you try to consign a VGA graded game to heritage auctions or even to certified link, they're going to most likely turn you away at present time and they're going to say, hey, we only accept WADA graded games for our auctions at this time. So you have several options if that were to occur. Let's suppose that you have a copy of The Legend of Zelda from 1987, factory sealed, graded by WADA Games in 9.4 condition. At present time, the market is rewarding items like that and placing a premium on them because we are in a speculative market for vintage graded video games right now. That being said, if you have an item like that and it's graded by WADA Games, you would be better off consigning that particular item to Heritage Auctions or Certified Link and not selling it on eBay because you would probably get a better price through one of those premier auction sites that caters to that market specifically. Now, let's assume you have that same game that's graded by VGA and you know well, just by looking at it, that if you sent that VGA graded game to WADA, it would come back a 9.2, 9.4 condition because there's no guarantee. You're dealing with graded collectibles. It's more of a art than it is a science. So you can crack that game open and it can come back from WADA in literally 9.0 condition. It does not have to come back a 9.2 or a 9.4. What I can tell you is most VGA 85 graded games, because they use a different scale than WADA, those near mint games that VGA has graded in 85, 85 plus condition, if you send them to WADA games, there is a 70 to 80% chance that that item will come back in 9.4 condition from WADA Games. I can tell you that. That doesn't mean that that's a guarantee. That statistic was generated from somebody I know who crossed a lot of VGA 85 graded games to WADA Games and 70 to 80% of them came back in 9.4 condition. Some were a little lower, some were a little bit higher. He did get some 9.6s out of that. That being said, if you want to do that, you want to take that risk, you can take that VGA game cross it to WADA, and you can then consign it to Heritage Auctions or Certified Link. Another option you have is eBay. I do not like eBay for high value items when selling. When buying, I love eBay for high value items because most of the people that you're dealing with who list a very high value item on eBay, they sometimes don't understand the way the market works or they forget to put a key characteristic in the listing of that item. And you can sometimes find great deals on very expensive items because eBay has become a dumping ground. Because not only can your experienced antique expert list on eBay, so can grandma who has no experience in any of these collecting categories. So you can find deals on eBay, guys. More on that in an upcoming video. So to summarize your question, depending on what type of item you have, whether it's vintage, modern, and what it is, that's going to pretty much determine where you're going to consign or sell that item for and to, if that makes sense. Next question. I'm a car guy, and I'm curious if you follow the car collecting community. Yes, I do. I have uncles, cousins who are really big into cars. It's not my thing. I consider it a money sink. I also consider investing in most classic and antique cars to be more of a passion than an investment. That said, 
If you really have the knowledge to fix cars, if you own your own shop, if you have a substantial net worth, I'm talking 10, 20 million dollars, you can make money in that market if you know what you're doing. The average person though that goes out there and buys an antique or a classic car, they will literally put several thousand dollars more into that car than what they can sell it for. It's just the nature of the beast. That goes double if you're not doing the work yourself. So you really have to be careful in that market. You have to understand the dynamics of that market and you also have to have the experience to profit from that market if that's your end goal. Again, if you have the money, you understand it's just a passion and not an investment, you want to get into that market, you do you. No harm, no foul. Next question. Thoughts on the game and watch market? Okay, I'm a huge Nintendo fan. This is something that people get wrong about me. I do like video games. Made a lot of money in the vintage video game marketplace, believe me. If I would tell some of you guys the stories, you guys would probably hate me because I manipulated the hell out of the market. I'm just going to keep it real. Back when Atari, Intellivision, Coleco, all these pre-Nintendo video game systems were selling for a premium between the years of 1995-2005. That market pretty much crashed and burned. I saw the writing on the wall. I was able to dump all of my inventory onto the market for a premium and a lot of people got upset even though I was telling them back when they were bidding on it that this market is not stable. It's not going to last. It's a speculative bubble. Now, what does this have to do with Game & Watch? Game & Watch is an esoteric collecting category that is part of Nintendo collecting. Don't get me wrong. So is Virtual Boy, so are Vintage NES Super Nintendo games, and also so is the Wii U. Well, certain sub-markets of that category are better than others. In my opinion, the Game & Watch marketplace is not as strong as Vintage Nintendo collecting is at present time. So it is an esoteric market. I don't see it going up in value exponentially in the future either. Even when video games become an established collecting category, a lot of people are not going to want to go back and get some of these loose Game & Watch items that are on the market. That said, if you have a Game & Watch item from the 80s that is complete in the box, mint in the box, factory sealed, by all means, keep it it could become more valuable than what it is now. But for 90% of the game and watches on the market out there today, I do not see a bright future for them. Hope that answers your question. If you want to know more, just let me know. I can do a whole video on game and watch collecting if you want, guys. I have a lot of knowledge in that market because I have a friend that actually repairs game and watch units and he makes good money doing it. It's just a very esoteric collecting category. Next question. I think you touched on this before in a previous video, but what is the difference between somebody who collects for fun as opposed to somebody who is collecting for investment? The perspective and the mindset of the person who's doing it. You know, I consider myself a collector investor. I have a passion for all the items that I buy. There's no, no discussion about that ever on this channel usually, but believe it or not, I do. I love all these items. That said, if you are going after these items with an investment mindset. They have to be looked at differently than somebody who has a passion for them because that passion, that emotional attachment is what gets most collectors in trouble. That's why we have a lot of people starting YouTube channels, going on online collecting forums, claiming that they're buying these items for investment without being able to properly assess the market and how the market's going to unfold 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. Let me use this as an example. When Bioshock came out, I'll never forget this. I went to Toys R Us and I really wanted to get that game because I love Bioshock. Still to this day, Bioshock is one of my favorite video game series because it kind of borrows a lot of elements from Atlas Shrugged, if you know the history of Ayn Rand. I am not a fan of Ayn Rand, which is why I love Bioshock. That being said, when I was in Toys R Us buying a copy of that game, there was somebody else there who wanted to buy it and keep it factory sealed. And we kind of got talking and he said, yeah, I'm putting together all these first edition Xbox 360 games that I'm going to keep factory sealed. And I said to him, you know, you'd be better off opening them and playing them. And this, I knew, offended him and he shot back with, I really think these items are going to be extremely valuable in the future. 
That's an example of someone who is allowing his passion to overtake not only logic and common sense, but also any fundamental basics in economics, finance, and the antiques and collectibles trade. I'm sorry, but what happened when the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One came out? They quickly released the Bioshock collection that has all three games on it. This is the norm going forward in video games, guys. You can have a passion for something, but you have to still be able to analyze how the market is responding to the items that you're collecting. Right now, we have Nintendo releasing Xenoblade Chronicles 3D for the Nintendo 3DS. Now they're coming out with Xenoblade Chronicles Definite Edition, and probably Xenoblade Chronicles will be released later for an upcoming Nintendo system that we don't even know about yet. So my point is, the market is changing for modern era video games and how they'll be perceived in the future. So that's how you have to analyze the market for a lot of these things. So if you have a passion for something, that's great, but don't let that passion override common sense and how you analyze the market. Because if you wanna be an investor, you really have to analyze all these markets devoid of any passion. Next question. I have an acceptable condition Flintstones Surprise at Dino Peak game, of which it is loose, and the game would rate in condition of a 4 out of a 10 due to damage on the top label. Do you think it'll keep its 7 to to $1,000 value or correct itself and go back to a steady two to $300 like in 2011? Okay, I really have to answer this in depth because there's a lot of people sorely mistaken as to what's happening in the market for vintage video games. Right now, we have a lot of speculators and a lot of unsophisticated investors and a lot of market manipulators coming in, looking at great video games as the next great big thing and Pansia. Now, I can follow the money in the antiques and collectibles trade. I can tell you that there is going to be a market for great video games in the near future and in the future because the powers that be want to make that happen and it's working. That being said, this is what nobody is really talking about. An item like this that used to sell for $700 and $1,000 back in 2011, 2012, even 2013, today is not seen as an investment grade item anymore. So all you guys out there with all these average condition loose games or copies of Little Samson, Flintstones at Dino Peak, Bubble Bobble 2, and a lot of these quote-unquote rare or scarce Nintendo games, however you want to look at the market, I don't think you realize that given the fact that investors and high-profile speculators are going after mint and complete or factory sealed graded copies of these games, that's affecting the value of the loose cartridges. That's why if you look at a lot of these loose cartridges, they're starting to drop in value. So I really hate to say this, you can expect your Flintstones at Dino Peak to continue dropping in price because the average person that wants that particular game, they may be happy with picking up a reproduction because the investor that would have normally went after a game like that in 2011 and 2012, now they're looking to get a complete in box graded copy or a complete in box factory sealed copy that's graded by WADA. So you really have to be careful if you're gonna enter the market right now for loose, quote unquote, rare vintage video games. Now there are some exceptions. If you're going after stadium events, if you're going after a Nintendo World Championships, of course you can't get that mint in box because it was only released in two versions, the gray cartridge or the gold cartridge version. Those particular items, they right now are still hot, even in mid-grade condition, even in cartridge only form because some of them are only available in cartridge only form, let's be honest. So I hope that answers your question. What are your thoughts on things that were designed and created to be collectible? Again, this goes back to the understanding of mass produced scarcity versus organic collectability. Anything that was released for the quote unquote collectibles marketplace on purpose, whether we're looking at Nintendo Amiibo, Funko Pops, limited run games, strictly limited games, all those items were created by marketing people and companies to deceive 
the unsophisticated speculator out there into thinking that because the print run of this item is only several thousand or maybe 10,000 or maybe 20,000, it's obviously going to be rare and sought after in the future. What people don't realize is the antiques and collectibles trade doesn't work that way. There's a reason why stadium events is sought after today. There's a reason why Black Lotus in Magic the Gathering is sought after today. Those items have organic collectability. Your items like your Funko Pop, your Nintendo Amiibo, your limited run games, they're great products, don't get me wrong. I have nothing against those items or their manufacturers. But the problem is they do not have organic collectability. And in order to invest in something long term, not short term, I'm not talking about speculation right now, but if you're investing in something long term, it has to have organic collectability. That's a key to value. That's why I like coins and currency. Coins and currency have organic collectability. An item like your latest Magic the Gathering set has mass produced scarcity in most cases. Ever hear the term bulk rares? It's a great oxymoron. Bulk rares refers to quote unquote rare magic cards that sell for a quarter or less per card. Well, ironically, if you go to the collectibles market, there really isn't anything that should be organically rare that has demand in an established market selling for a quarter or less. Let's be realistic. So that's the way that you analyze those markets. So I hope that answers your question. Sean, what are the different grading companies for the collectibles out there? The top grading companies for comics. Okay, for comic books, you have CGC, which is owned and operated by the Certified Collectibles Group down in Sarasota, Florida, which also owns NGC and PMG. And competing with them is CBCS Comics, which is kind of an upstart in comic grading, but they do have an edge because I think Steve Borak, who was a primary CGC grader, is head of that company, if I recall correctly. So the two top grading companies for comics are CGC, CBCS. Now I want to add a caveat to this. This is in my opinion. Somebody else may give you a whole different opinion as to what company's better, what company you should avoid. Not going to get into that in this video. All is what I'm telling you is, as I answer these questions, these are the companies that I would do business with. So let me word it that way. Next question. What are the different grading companies for toys and action figures? The best one that you want to know of if you're going into toys and action figures is AFA, Action Figure Authority. They're out of Norcross, Georgia, and they're also affiliated with VGA, Video Game Authority. The next question, what are the different grading companies for games, systems, and video games? VGA out of Norcross, Georgia, and also Wadic Games, which is out of, is it Colorado? I think it's Colorado. Is it Colorado or Illinois? I forget where Wada Games is located. I'm sorry, Wada Games, but I do give you a lot of credibility. I just forget where your offices are located at present time. What are the top grading companies for coins and currency? Let's take coins first. NGC and PCGS. NGC, again, is affiliated with CGC and PMG. More on PMG in a minute here. And they're out of Sarasota, Florida. PCGS is predominantly the most notorious coin grading company. PCGS stands for Professional Coin Grading Service, ironically, and they are a member of the Collector's Universe group, and they are pretty much the predominant company that competes against NGC at present time. There is a company called CAC, which is Certified Acceptance Corp. What Certified Acceptance Corporation does is they only look at and review graded coins from NGC and PCGS, and what they do is they look to see if they're authentically graded. Meaning, if you send them a coin that's graded by NGC or PCGS in MS64, they will look at that coin, and if they agree with the grade, they will put a green CAC sticker on that particular coin. Now, if they look at that coin, and they don't think it should have been graded an NGC MS64 or a PCGS MS64, they'll send it back to you and won't even put any sticker on it. If, however, CAC looks at that coin, and they say, hey, this NGC or PCGS specimen that's in MS64 condition should have been graded in MS65, they put a gold sticker on it and they send it back to you. So coin grading gets a little more nuanced because we actually have a grading company of grading companies. Figure that one out. Now let's talk about currency. 
Currency, there is two predominant players, and that is PCGS Banknote, also known formally as PCGS Currency. And you also have PMG, Paper Money Guarantee, which again is affiliated with NGC and CGC down in Sarasota, Florida. Are you confused yet with this wonderful mirage of alphabet soup? Because that's pretty much what all these grading companies are. Now when we get to Pokemon cards, sports cards, Magic the Gathering cards, you have PSA and you also have BGS, which is Beckett. Now PSA is ironically affiliated with PCGS. They are part of the Collector's Universe line of companies. So it's kind of interesting how all this fits together. Next question that you have is, at what temperature and humidity level would be inside my safe where I store my collectibles? Um, that is a great question. It depends on what you are storing. The key predominant factor for preserving collectibles is moderate and average temperatures, meaning trying to maintain an average temperature throughout the year, and also no or little humidity. Humidity is really what destroys antiques and collectibles. So I don't care what type of collectible or antique you have, just be careful with humidity and you should be okay overall as long as it's not exposed to the elements or direct sunlight. Direct sunlight can hurt a lot of collectibles as you can imagine. So just be careful with those two things. Now, next, I love how much knowledge you have to share for such a wide market. What is your personal favorite collectible in some of your most mentioned segments? Okay, when we get to Pokemon, Magic, and items of that nature, I tend to speculate in those items. I don't hold them for long-term investment. I have came across some very valuable Pokemon and Magic Gathering collections that I've sold respectively in the years 2016, 2017. I never liked holding them long-term because I predicted successfully the downturn in prices in reserve list Magic the Gathering cards. And those of you that want proof of that, if you go back to the articles I write in Antiques and Auction News, back in the early 2017, I wrote an article on the Magic the Gathering and I talked specifically about Rudy of Alpha Investments and I stated that a speculative bubble was brewing in that market that would pop soon and I even stated that I was selling off all my holdings at that time. I got completely out just about of the Magic the Gathering collectible market in 2017 right before the bubble popped. I had enough sense to get out of the market. Um, in regards to Pokemon, I consider that market more stable for vintage stuff, but at the same token, I caution people from putting a lot of money in that particular market. I do not collect stamps. I have appraised stamps in the past. I do not consider that market fully stable at present time due to the weakness of collecting stamps in present day. Coins I love. We could do video after video of coins. Um, I do hold a coin collection that is valued in six figures. It is in a safety deposit box. I also collect currency. If you guys want me to do a video where I go through and talk about some of my favorite holdings, let me know and I will do that. As for antiques, I love traditional antiques. I love antique weaponry. I love art glass. I love art pottery. I love a lot of vintage advertising, which can also skirt the antiques trade, meaning vintage Coca-Cola advertising, Pepsi-Cola advertising. This whole house, if I would ever do a house tour, is pretty much accented with a lot of valuable pieces in the vintage advertising realm, along with certain pieces of art glass from Tiffany Loewetz, and of course, Rookwood art pottery, because I love Rookwood. Um, anything else here, you put in Beanie Babies. I do not do anything with Beanie Babies. I will occasionally find Beanie Babies in the wild that I know I can flip on eBay for a profit. I will buy them, I will flip them, and I will wish whoever gets them the best of luck, because I don't consider that a stable market. There is one to three percent of the Beanie Baby market that pretty much is still selling at predominantly high prices, not compared to where it was back during the speculative bubble, but there are some Beanie Babies that people do want to buy and own, and there are facets of that market that if you know what you're doing, you can make money in that particular market. Next question. Sean, another topic I would like to hear you discuss is which collecting markets have gotten absolutely hammered in conjunction with the stock market sell-off. Where can deals be found right now? The best deals in particular collecting categories. Where can your viewers find value? 
Okay, be very careful with this mindset. This is more of a speculative mindset. If you approach a lot of these collecting categories from the standpoint of an investor, you're really not gonna look for quote unquote deals. What I will tell you is, in any time we have a market sell off or an economic downturn, most collectibles of the lower to mid tiers drop in value because a lot of the collectors that were going after those items can no longer afford to buy them. So for instance, your loose video games, your played with magic cards, Pokemon cards, vintage toys, um, comic books that aren't near mint condition, a lot of those items drop in value substantially during any type of economic downturn because the middle class and lower class of collectors that go after those items, no offense should be taken by that, I'm just stating a fact, the people that earn $40,000 or less who collect those items can no longer afford to buy those items. And what happens is if they need money, it's the first thing that they sell. It's just like when I look at Rudy with Alpha Investments or even Scott Pratt. One of the aspects of their business model of which they become very successful is if you need money, you can easily send a Magic the Gathering collection to Rudy of Alpha Investments and he'll give you a fair amount of money at present market values for that collection. Well, most people who are taking advantage of that are people who make $50,000 or less on average who get hit with hard economic times. That's why they don't want to be featured in some of his videos that he does on particularly buying those collections for that particular reason. So I hope that answers your question. Um, one more question I do want to hit towards the end since nobody's really watching. What advice should I, should, would you have for somebody who wants to invest their new stimulus check that's coming from the government? Well, if you do earn less than $75,000 a year, you will be getting a $1,200 stimulus check from the U.S. government. That is not free money, guys. Make no mistake. Your tax dollars paid for that particular money to be given out in this hard economic time. Now, me being a liberal progressive, I'm glad that you guys got $1,200 from the government if you do need that money. That being said, I really don't apply to this because I make more than $75,000, so I'm probably not going to get a check from the government anytime soon. That being said, where I would invest it is if you have debt, pay down your debt first. If your job's stable, be glad that your job's stable. Then, if those two criteria are met, meaning you're paying down debt, your job is stable, I would honestly put it in an S&P 500 index fund or a total stock market index fund through Vanguard or Fidelity or Charles Schwab, whatever fund company you want to go through. That would be the best thing that you could do with that money for your financial future. If you are looking at antiques and collectibles, what I would advise you to do is look for deals. Again, I just told you guys that pretty much if we do enter an extended economic recession, the low end of the market is going to be where you can come in, buy up some collections and flip them. It's going to be a lot of work. You're really going to have to hustle in that side of the market. It's almost like when I was 16 years old going to flea markets and garage sales, flipping stuff on eBay. It's that point that you're getting back to, the hustle mindset, where you're trying to buy this stuff, you're trying to flip it for a dollar, and you keep the money moving. That's what I would advise you to do with that money. I hope that helps. I hope this video has been helpful. This is part two of my 1500 subscriber Q&A. There will be a part three coming soon. Thank you guys, thank you for watching, and thank you for all your feedback. Even if you don't agree with me, I still like the fact that you take the time to listen to my point of view and watch my videos. Stay safe out there, have a great night.